Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris, for that generous uh, introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to be with you here today and to think with you about some questions that I think different disciplines um, can invigorate, and that is the changing notion of atonement. Now, Atonement is a word that is so dense with all those overlapping layers of meaning and significance that I almost tremble when I try to use it at all. And yet the problem that it addresses, a relationship that's been ruptured by a sense of culpable injury, that's one that's fundamental not just to human societies, but even also to some of the other higher primates like chimpanzees and bonobos. It's also very similar to the legal term tort, which connotes a wrongful act that results in injury to another's person or property or reputation or the like, and for which the injured party is entitled to compensation. Now in social terms, the wrongful act creates a kind of social estrangement, but when it's remedied, it allows for reconciliation. Now, if you can look into the biblical texts, one of the earliest examples we have of this is the meeting of Jacob and Esau in Genesis 32. You remember, Jacob is returning and he knows that his earlier actions toward Esau, deceiving their father Isaac and capturing the blessing that was intended for Esau, that has caused a material and a social injury to Esau. So Joseph seeks to propitiate him, in Hebrew, kaper, hoping that Esau will respond with a gesture of acceptance. Perhaps he will lift up my face. And that would signal the restored social balance. Now, in political contexts, too, the unjust imbalance has to be addressed in order to restore not just proper relationships, but sometimes the very order of things. 2 Samuel 21, there's a severe famine during David's reign, and they inquire and discover it's because of blood guilt incurred by Saul's execution of a number of Gibeonites. So David asked the Gibeonites, what should I do to make expiation? And here it's the injured party who sets the terms for appropriate compensation, and they ask for the lives of seven of Saul's male offspring. Now, in the religious realm, the same basic logic operates, although, of course, only in one direction, given the difference between God and humans. But the problem of actions offensive to God and how to remedy them is a topic that's treated in a number of places in the Bible. Now, in the priestly writings, there's this highly developed system classifying offenses according to the status of the offender, the intentionality of the offense, and the cultic system is designed to address mostly inadvertent or unintentional sins, some of which the perpetrator may not even be aware of. Sins that are committed arrogantly or particularly heinous sins don't have a cultic remedy, And the only thing is for the perpetrator to be cut off, apparently meaning the extirpation of their family line. But if you move outside of the priestly compositions, however, there's a rich discussion concerning sin and atonement, rupture and reconciliation in narratives, in hortatory texts, in prophetic texts, and in psalms. And these treatments testify to a much more fluid and complex system for dealing with breaches of relationship and how to repair them, including those that are committed consciously and arrogantly. Now, the means may differ, but there's a social transactional manner in which the ways in which people attempt to restore a ruptured relationship with God. In place of sacrificial compensation, the the offending party may offer acts of contrition, acts of self-humiliation. In some instances, petitioners just seek reconciliation because God is gracious and God may forego any compensation or the desire to punishment and simply forgive. Now, it's possible that sometimes there's a little passive-aggressive manipulation in this. David Lambert has argued that certain rites of repentance, like fasting and wearing sackcloth, may actually operate more like hunger strikes 
to make God so uncomfortable that God forgives the people so they will please stop afflicting themselves. But even these, you can see, are a kind of offering of self-humiliation that acknowledges the distress that the people themselves have that their misdeeds have caused this breach in the relationship. Now, all of these practices are based on the common sense assumption that people in society are free moral agents. But what if those assumptions about moral agency are challenged? What if the problem is not what you've done, but who you are? Listen to how this poet describes human nature in a passage from Thanksgiving psalms that were composed and found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. What is one born of woman? He's a thing constructed of dust and kneaded with water. Sinful guilt is his foundation, obscene shame and a source of impurity, and a perverted spirit rules him. When he acts wickedly, he becomes a sign forever, a portent for distant generations of flesh. As for me, from dust you took me, and from clay I was pinched off as a source of impurity and obscene shame, a th heap of dust, a thing kneaded with water, a council of maggots, a dwelling of darkness. And there's a return to dust for the vessel of clay at the time of your anger. Dust returns to that from which it was taken. What can dust and ashes reply concerning your judgments? How can it understand its deeds? How can it stand before the one who reproves it? Well, that's a problem that the system of cultic atonement <laughs> and the social practices of reconciliation are just not designed to address. Now, in one sense, of course, the problem remains what you've done in that this abysmal creature described in this psalm literally can't do anything that's not offensive to God thus ensuring God's disgust and judgment. But the problem is compounded by the fact that this miserable being can't even grasp that what it's doing is sinful. How can it understand its deeds? And even if it could, it doesn't have the moral capacity to offer any gesture of reconciliation or contrition or repentance. The origin of this problem is not to be traced to some lack of moral formation some failure over which it might have putative control. Neither is there a fall, nor is, can this be traced to consequences of angelic misbehavior, as in Enoch, or to demonic deception. Rather, as this passage attests, this being was created without moral capacity from the moment it was pinched off from clay. Now, the fact that a person has no moral agency doesn't avert the consequences. Sin and impurity are objective conditions. So this poor individual is utterly trapped. It is in its very being offensive to God, despite having no capacity to be or to do otherwise. Now, how these Qumran Thanksgiving Psalms come to this remarkable conclusion is a process that we don't have time to trace here, although in short, it's a combination of their sectarian self-narrative developed through some complex exegetical practices. But even before the Dead Sea Scrolls community, the issue and the problem of innate and intractable human moral deficiency was already an issue of considerable concern in earlier Second Temple Judaism, that is the period uh, after the exile. And to get a handle on why this issue was of such importance and what the issues and what the implications were, I want to ask three questions. One, can we locate where the framing of the problem of sin as radical defect comes from? And second, once the problem is framed as a problem about human nature itself, how's the solution to the problem envisioned? And third, how does changing the discourse about sin in a way that seems really negative, paradoxically, open up new forms of spiritual intimacy and even spiritual ecstasy. So let's look at the origins of this shift. <clears throat> 
It's important not to oversimplify, but one critical point of origin in the development of doubt about free moral agency emerges from the attempt to grapple with the traumatic events of the destruction of the kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians in 586. Now, you see, at the time, the current understanding of political and military success or failure, a model you can find in the prophets and in Deuteronomy and the histories, was that success or failure was a consequence of obedience or disobedience to God's commands. So the destruction of Judah, when it happened, was inevitably understood as a catastrophic failure of moral agency. The nation, despite clear warnings of the consequences of disobedience, had done so anyway. And that suggested that the problem was more radical than just a sequence of bad choices. It seemed to point to a defect in the fundamental moral equality equipment of the people. If that's the case, then what the people had done was just a symptom of some problem with the people themselves. Now, in ancient Israel, they thought about moral psychology in terms of the organs of the body, and the heart was the primary organ where the moral will was located. So as they describe the problem, they'll describe it in bodily terms. And in the early post-exilic additions to Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Leviticus, they begin to refer to the problem of the uncircumcised heart. There's a physical impediment that has to be removed before the heart can function as a moral organ. Now, this image implies that obedience and even reconciliation after disobedience are blocked unless there is a fundamental transformation of the people. In what are likely the earliest uses of this image in Jeremiah 4 and Deuteronomy 10, this transformation is actually one that the people can do for themselves. So that view still preserves something of the people's own moral agency. They can be their own surgeons. Now, in the post-exilic passage that's added in Deuteronomy 30, the agency for the circumcision of the heart shifts from the people to God. Now, this is a complicated passage, and scholars interpret it somewhat differently. Verses 1 to 2 describes an act of returning or repentance by Israel. And this is often read to suggest that first Israel repents, and then God responds by circumcising Israel's heart. If that's the case, then the people still have enough moral agency to repent, and God's circumcising of the heart is simply an action that will ensure that in the future they will be able reliably to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to obey all his commandments, and so avoid future disasters. But Mark Brettler says, you know, this can be read differently. It's also possible to read this passage so that even Israel's repentance is itself the result of God's action on the people. See, that's a more deterministic reading, which shifts all of the agency to God. And in fact, that is the way this passage was read in later Second Temple Judaism. Read in this way, the people lack even the ability to see that they have sinned and to repent of their sins. Even repentance has to come from God. So that's a more radical view of the problem. Jeremiah uses different imagery, but he comes to much the same conclusion. In Jeremiah, the problem of moral failure is usually framed as a problem of understanding. For some reason, the heart, that is the mind, seems unable to receive and internalize Torah, the teachings. But this is not simply a functional failure. When Jeremiah imagines what would it take to solve this problem, he envisions God physically placing the teaching, the Torah, into the body of the people and writing or inscribing it on the heart itself. So that physical intervention draws attention to the heart as this objectified problematic thing that has to be fixed. The divine action replaces the failed human process of teaching and learning. 
No longer will they teach one another because now the teaching is physically inscribed on the heart. And that creates the desired knowledge of the Lord, thus allowing God to forgive the people. So the imagery suggests that the people will then never again sin since the teaching is hardwired under their hearts. Problem solved. Now, the most radical depiction of failed moral agency and divine intervention is in Ezekiel. Now, to be sure, some passages in Ezekiel do speak as though moral agency is still a real possibility, chapter 18. But whether we should understand those passages as just inconsistencies, a shift required by context, or perhaps Ezekiel's own changing sense of perspective, there's no doubt, as Jacqueline Lapsley has persuasively demonstrated, the overall conclusion of the book of Ezekiel is a radical claim that Israel's massive failures of obedience can only be explained by the assumption that the people never, ever possessed functional moral agency. In chapter 16 and 23, Ezekiel narrates two long allegorical stories that argue that the people of Jerusalem were predeterminedly possessed of a depraved nature from birth. And in chapter 20, Ezekiel gives a revisionist history of Israel, which differs sharply from what you'll find in the Pentateuch, suggesting that the people were literally obsessed with idols, even from the time that God was redeeming them from Egypt. That is, from their very birth as a nation, they were obsessively morally depraved. This wholly negative view of the people is summed up in that image of the heart of stone which the people possess. What they are is the problem. And the solution can only be found in God's decision that he will remove the heart of stone from your body and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit into you. And the result of the transformation Thus, I will cause you to follow my laws and faithfully observe my rules. So in a manner very similar to Jeremiah, it appears that it's the divine spirit in the people that ensures that their actions will be completely faithful. Problem solved. Now, there's one other biblical book that contains a view of human nature that is, if anything, even more radical than Ezekiel. That's the book of Job specifically in the speeches of Job's friends, Eliphaz and Bildad. Now, this is an immensely learned book, probably from the early Second Temple period, and Job draws on the international traditions of wisdom literature, but especially Mesopotamia. Still, the radically negative anthropology that shows up here is without any close parallel in either Israel or Mesopotamia. In chapter 4, Eliphaz reports the words of this mysterious voice he hears in a dream vision. Can a mortal be righteous before God or a man pure before his maker? Truly, God does not trust his own servants and attributes fault to the angels. How much less those who dwell in houses of clay whose foundation is in the dust. And again in chapter 15, what is a mortal that he could be pure or that one born of woman could be righteous. Truly, God does not trust his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his eyes. How much less one who is loathsome and foul, a human who drinks iniquity like water. And finally, in chapter 25, Bildad one-ups him. How can a mortal be righteous before God? Or how can one born of woman be pure? Truly, even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less a mortal, a worm, a human, a maggot. Well, in contrast to the texts in Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, which at least envisioned a solution to the problem, these texts from Job are not interested in suggesting a solution. They are offered to you solely as grim theodicy. They simply explain human moral corruption as a natural consequence of your physical corruptibility. There's no possible solution because the problem is ontological. Sketching a great chain of being from God to heavenly beings to humans and maggots. Now, to be sure, 
Elsewhere in the book of Job, the friends do assume that people do have free moral agency, and the variety of the friends' arguments is a useful reminder that most of the time people carry around with themselves different models and beliefs that are logically inconsistent and sometimes even contradictory to one another. Now, these don't create a sense of cognitive dissonance because we usually employ them in different frames of reference. So when the friends construct what we might call a horizontal argument, they can compare righteous people and wicked people and easily distinguish between good and poor moral agency and treat people as capable of repentance. But when the friends construct a vertical argument, and compare humans qua humans with God's righteousness, then all humans are viewed as being abysmal in their nature. Now, as striking as this topos of moral disgusting humanity is in the book of Job, it's pretty isolated in the biblical tradition. But are there any other negative anthropologies in the Bible? What about Genesis 2-3, to the Garden of Eden story in the primeval history? Now, in the Yahweh's creation narrative in Genesis 2 to 3, um, even though it later comes to play a distinctive role in the Christian doctrine of original sin, in its original context, it's actually more plausibly read as the creation story of the origin of moral capacity itself. The tree that's off limits to the first humans is described as the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, tov and ra very broad terms uh, encompassing all kinds of valuations, not just moral ones, and the capacity to know or discriminate between what's good, what's bad, is the mark of judicious cognitive maturity, reflective deliberation. Deuteronomy 1 says very young children don't have this yet, and 2 Samuel 19 says that this capacity can decline along with other capacities, in very advanced old age. So it represents a kind of cognitive mental maturity. That eating from the tree of knowledge adds, rather than takes away from human capacity, is clearly indicated in Genesis 3, because eating the fruit makes Eve and Adam like God, or like the gods. So humans can now deliberatively choose for themselves, both in non-moral and moral contexts. Where's the problem? It's that humans who are created from the dust of the earth are not in fact divine beings. And so apparently we can't use that capacity consistently wisely. By the time we get to Genesis 6, the Yahwist prefaces its account of the flood story with the despairing judgment that the whole tendency, Yetzer in Hebrew, the whole tendency of the plans devised by the human mind was nothing but bad, raw, all the time. Now, the words that Genesis 6 uses are picked up in later rabbinic thought in the expression yetzer ra, evil inclination, which in rabbinic thought does become an objectified aspect of moral psychology. But that's a later development. Even so, Genesis 6's pessimism about human ingenuity points to some sense that our unanticipated combination of animal and divine characteristics does create a structural defect that makes us, at best, unreliable moral agents. Now, I actually like to use a computer analogy to get at what they're talking about. It's like we're trying to run divine software with an animal operating system. <laughs> Problems are going to happen. At any rate, in contrast to Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, but like Job, the Yahweh's narrative does not envision any solution to this problem. The flood solves nothing. After the flood, Yahweh says again, the tendencies of the human mind are just bad from its youth. There's nothing to be done. Although, fortunately, God does promise not to send us a flood again. So, where are we? Although most of the Hebrew Bible asserts, asserts that people have free moral agency, the reaction to the destruction of the kingdom of Judah led to the conclusion that there had been something radically wrong with Judah's moral capacity. 
The prophets in Deuteronomy, however, envisioned God intervening to repair the people so that they can remain in covenant. Now, whether the negative reflections that we find in the early post-exilic texts in Job and Genesis 2 to 3 were also delayed reactions to the trauma of destruction and exile is really hard to say. But in the succeeding centuries, this concern that there is some inherent moral flaw, an innate sinful condition, it persists and it's developed. So let's look at some of those later developments. Now, Ezekiel, of course, was mainly concerned with the problem of the sin of the people as a national entity. But the first evidence of Ezekiel's representation of a fundamentally defective moral self occurs in a prayer of the individual, Psalm 51. This psalm begins with the traditional representation of sin as wrongful actions, referring to my transgressions, my iniquity, my sin, as things that I have done against God. The first suggestion of a more radical view comes in verse 7, where the speaker describes his iniquity and sin as congenital. I was born with iniquity. My mother conceived me with sin. Echoing the perspectives, if not the actual words of Ezekiel. Actual intertextual allusions to Ezekiel occur in verses 12 to 13, where the creation of a pure heart and the renewal of a steadfast spirit in my body echo the one heart and new spirit of Ezekiel 11. And the request that God not take away your Holy Spirit alludes to the placement of my spirit, that is God's spirit, in your body in Ezekiel 36. So the fundamental problem is not just sins, but a sinful condition. And the resolution is not merely forgiveness of specific sins. It has to be a transformation of the moral being that the speaker is unable to accomplish for himself. That is distinctively new in psalmic prayer. But notice, when Ezekiel's language gets reframed in a petitionary prayer, there's a significant change in perspective. For Ezekiel, Israel was so depraved, it had no awareness of how radically sinful it was until after God intervenes. Only after Israel is transformed, does it have sufficient understanding to remember your evil ways and loathe yourselves for your iniquities and abhorrent practices. Self-directed moral disgust in Ezekiel is actually the result of the gracious gift of a moral self. But in order to utter a petitionary prayer about his defective heart and spirit, the speaker of Psalm 51 has to be already aware of and anxious about his sinful condition. So you can see this is a more complex subjectivity. The speaker is aware of his profound offensiveness to God and yet is powerless to do anything about it except to appeal to the very God who is offended by his sinfulness. Now, the speaker's position of helpless vulnerability is, of course, similar to that of the earlier lament psalms in which the fearful opponents are the psalmist's human enemies or other threatening forces. But now, look, the fearful opponent is the psalmist's own defective heart. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of petitionary prayers or even Thanksgiving prayers from the, this period, but we do have a few from the, beyond the Bible that have been discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Miriam Brand has analyzed these, and she notes the shift from a concern with sins as actions to the problem of intractable sinful condition. In one of the non-biblical psalms found at Qumran, just as in Psalm 51, the speaker begins with traditional language, but then introduces a novel image of sin as disease and as a parasitic plant. The sins of my youth cast far from me, and let my transgressions not be remembered against me. Purify me, O Lord, from the evil affliction, and let it not return to me. Dry up its roots from me. Let its leaves not flourish within me. 
Now, evil affliction sometimes refers to a pain or disease that's a consequence of sin. But here, it's clearly, it refers to the sinful condition itself or the inherent propensity to sin. Since the following image of sin as a plant growing within the speaker refers back to that affliction. So the image gives us a metaphor of sin as an objectified alien entity within the individual. And yet, it's my own sin. As in Psalm 51, the speaker's only agency is in recognizing and recoiling from this aspect of himself and pleading with God to transform him by destroying this alien aspect of the self. Now, not surprisingly, the idea of sinful condition as an alien element of the self merges with the newly developing understanding of demonic powers as spirits that not only bring misfortune, disease, and sudden death, but demons that will create moral blindness and lead persons astray. That, too, is a new development in demonology. Uh, Psalm 19, Psalm 119 is a good example. There, the speaker frequently asks God for moral strengthening and requests, let not any iniquity rule over me. But in a reinterpretation of this verse, in the Aramaic Levi document from Qumran, Levi prays, and let not any Satan rule over me to make me stray from your path, recasting iniquity as a demonic spirit. But the difference between sin as an external alien power and as an internal aspect of oneself turns out to be quite fluid. In another non-canonical psalm, the plea for deliverance, the speaker begs for purification from sin and prays, let not a Satan rule over me or an impure spirit. Let pain and the evil inclination not have control over me. Now, the parallelism between Satan and evil inclination and between the verbs rule over and have control implies at least a functional similarity between the two sources of the alien sinful will. And that's not really surprising because as demons become active in causing moral harm, they operate on the thoughts and the moral will of a person. Now, I find it interesting that this plea for deliverance is perhaps the earliest attestation of the objectification of the Yetzer Ra, the evil inclination, as an aspect of anthropology. Although in Second Temple Judaism, it never achieves quite the central role that it will in later rabbinic thought. But the way it gets assimilated to imagery of the demonic is found in other texts as well. There's one collection called Barki Nafshi, Bless the Lord, O My Soul. Now, these are thanksgiving psalms. And so in contrast to the petitionary prayers, the speaker here is one who's already experienced divine transformation. And in one remarkable passage, the, the author exploits the ancient Israelite anthropology that distributes moral proclivities and actions to various body parts. And in this prayer, the author constructs a whole catalog of parts of the body in which each has been transformed by God from being morally problematic to morally positive. And behind this development, of course, you can hear the tropes from Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Psalm 51. You have commanded my heart and my kidneys you have taught well, lest they forget your statutes. On my heart you have enjoined your law. On my kidneys you have engraved it. The heart of stone you have rebuked out of me and have set a pure heart in its place. The evil inclination you have rebuked out of my kidneys and the spirit of holiness you have set in my heart. Lechery of the eyes you have removed from me and they gazed upon all your ways. The stiffness of neck you have expelled from me and you have made it into humility, etc. The passage constructs something of a spiritual exercise in which the various parts of the body are objectified as places of moral concern. And the evil inclination, too, is placed among the other moral deficits and even given an organ in the body. The, the heart of stone and the yatzer are rebuked out of the body is significant, since that's the verb that's used for expelling demons. Now, even if this is just a metaphor 
The verb aptly configures the heart of stone and the evil inclination as internal alien wills from which the speaker wants to be freed. Now, in the text I've examined so far, what I've been attempting to trace is a shift in how the problem of sin and its solution is framed. The classic model presents sin as an offense, creating a breach that requires resolution through social practices of atonement and reconciliation. But the text from the Exilic and Second Temple period presents sin as a problem that first and foremost requires a transformation of a human who is in some way structurally morally defective and thus continually and consistently offensive to God. This transformation can't be affected by the human, but must be a gift from God. At most, the human can recognize and be appalled by it and sometimes distance himself from it by envisioning it as a kind of alien force or will within himself. This new stance of piety, I think, is characterized by the moral pathos of a being who's as much a victim of sin as a perpetrator of it. But as we see in Barki Nafshi, as each side of the body is a place for anxiety-producing moral flaws, each place also becomes a site for God's intimate act of repair and moral healing. So oddly, reducing the scope of human agency and magnifying the negative representation of yourself becomes a means of enhancing and experiencing the compassion and power of God. Now note, though, that although these prayers create their moral vision by deliberately avoiding the more radical critiques found in Ezekiel and Job. Ezekiel's got no place for the appealing moral subject painfully aware of his defects and seeking divine aid. Ezekiel's view is of the human as morally abject. Only after the moral transformation is any moral consciousness possible, and then only as a form of self-loathing. Eliphaz and Bildad's human is morally disgusting in the ways a maggot is disgusting. Now, you might think that these radically negative depictions don't provide very promising material for exploring the potentialities of the spiritual life, but you would be wrong. <laughs> the authors of the Qumran Thanksgiving hymns perceived a paradox that has intrigued ascetic religion religious virtuosos in a lot of traditions, the close connection between degradation and exaltation. So drawing on sociologist Peter Berger's analysis, I referred to this phenomenon as the cultivation of the masochistic sublime. <laughs> in fact, self-denigration can become a kind of engine for creating an experience of transformation and elevation. I'm not recommending it, I'm just describing it. The Thanksgiving Psalms from Qumran construct this hyper-negative anthropology, exegetically connecting all those nasty bits from Job with the creation traditions of Genesis 2 to 3 to make the extraordinary claim that human moral depravity is implicit in the very materiality of human existence. Why are you morally defective? Because you are made from dust. Moreover, these psalms claims that humans are morally depraved because God created them to be that way. Now, that's a condition that exceeds the logic of traditional forms of atonement and reconciliation. Such a shocking anthropology, however, is the precondition for God's wondrous action in transforming certain elect humans through an act of second creation, envisioned as in Ezekiel 36, as the implantation of God's own spirit. But in contrast to Ezekiel, where the end result is simply, okay, a now functioning human moral agent who can fulfill the commandments, the Qumran Psalms exploit the undeveloped potential of Ezekiel's imagery. What does it mean for God's Holy Spirit to be placed inside elect humans? The Hodeot concludes that the result is a purified and almost divinized person. Although you're still a bodily being, the human who now bears within herself the divine spirit has been endowed with a purity that enables her to be united with the angels themselves in a congregation of praise and to take up his station with the divine beings. That is to say, 
Although the Qumran Psalms are certainly interested in the moral aspects of transformation, their distinctive contribution is to explore the spiritual and I think even the ontological aspects. But how did they reach these conclusions? If you look at the imagery associated with negative anthropology in these texts, it's clear that the negative imagery is largely associated with the mortal and material aspects of humanity. Dust, clay, flesh, occasional references to corpses, worms, and maggots. So this materiality is correlated with guilt, sin, iniquity, impurity, which they associate particularly with female bodies and with birth from female bodies. Now, one of their most common designations of the human is that we are a vessel, a yatzer of dust, a vessel of clay kneaded with water, alluding to Genesis 2-7, where God formed Yatsar, the first human, out of the dust of the soil. And at least 10 times they refer to Genesis 3-19, until you return to the soil from which you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. But in Genesis That just refers to mortality, not to immorality. And although Genesis 3 refers to Eve as the mother of all the living, there's no implication that that somehow renders all humans essentially impure. So what allows the authors of these Qumran Psalms to reinterpret the creation traditions in such a radical manner? Well, interpretive practices in Second Temple Judaism were not arbitrary, But what they thought was that new dimensions of meaning, new revelatory understanding, could be unlocked by juxtaposing texts that use the same or similar words and concepts. For the Qumran Psalms, the key texts that unlock the negative anthropology of the creation traditions lies in Job. Now, Job contains a surprising number of references to human creation, most of which, however, are not negative but that the Qumran Psalms are specifically drawing on Job is demonstrated by the fact that they have used the highly unique or distinctive phrases from that book, pinched off from clay, unique to Job, dust and ashes, only in Job and once in Genesis, born of woman, unique to Job. Now that phrase, born of woman, allows us to trace the exegetical connections that the Qumran Psalms forge to use Job to unlock the hidden meaning of Genesis. First of all, two of the three occurrences of born of woman in Job are in the negative anthropologies of Eliphaz and Bildad, where humans are described as abhorrent, foul, impure, and guilty. The other occurrence in Job 14.1 introduces the passage in which Job protests, no one can make a clean thing from an unclean one, referring to humankind. So this proximity encourages the transfer of a negative sense to the phrase born of woman, and that allows a link to references to female impurity that can contaminate others who come in contact with it, as in Leviticus 20. Although the Qumran Psalms don't clearly refer to Psalm 51, in sin my mother conceived me, it's likely that they understood the physical aspects of birth to render all persons impure and congenitally sinful. Also, the book of Job makes other references to birth from the female body that link it to creation accounts, as in Job's first words in Job 1, where Job parallels birth from the mother's womb and the return to death uh, death to the womb of the earth. And that makes a connection with Genesis 3.19, until you return to the ground for from it you were taken, etc. Job 10 describes the formation of the human fetus, using the pair dust and clay to describe the being that God creates, but then is going to watch and judge for its inevitable sinfulness. Consider that you fashioned me like clay. Will you turn me back to dust? Job 10. The final piece of evidence that the book of Job plays a pivotal role in the development of this negative anthropology is a passage in one of the Qumran texts that refers to my foundation of dust, a clear allusion to Eliphaz's speech in Job 4 about humankind whose foundation is in the dust. 
So you can see the Job texts become the exegetical key for a radical reinterpretation of creation from the dust in Genesis 2-7, and the means for an equal radical association of birth from a woman with congenital sinfulness and impurity. You can hear the echoes from Genesis, from Job, from Leviticus, in a passage from one of these Qumran compositions. As for me, from dust you took me, and from clay I was pinched off as a source of impurity and obscene shame, a heap of dust, a thing needed with water, a council of maggots, a dwelling of darkness. And there is a return to dust for the vessel of clay at the time of your anger. Dust returns to that from which it was taken. What can dust and ashes reply concerning your judgment? Now, the miserable creature that's described in this psalm would, of course, not have this knowledge about himself at the time. But these are thanksgiving psalms. And so these are the utterances of a person who's already been transformed by God. The capacity for understanding the profound mysteries of existence, including the nature of human existence and its role in the divine plan, is explained in a phrase that's repeated six times. This understanding comes from the spirit you have placed in me. And as John Levinson has demonstrated, that phrase is an adaptation of Ezekiel 36, I will place my spirit in you. Several times the spirit is referred to as your Holy Spirit, as in Psalm 51. And this new Holy Spirit from God is both the source of the speaker's moral agency and his knowledge of divine mysteries. The purifying waters that God had sprinkled on Israel in Ezekiel 36 are reinterpreted here as the sprinkling of your Holy Spirit on the elect to purify them. But look, the purpose and result of this transformation in the Qumran Psalm far exceeds what Ezekiel envisions and reverses all of the negative anthropology in Job. For the sake of your glory, you have purified a mortal from sin so that he may sanctify himself for you from all impure abominations and from faithless guilt, so that he might be united with the children of your truth and in the lot with your holy ones, so that a corpse-infesting maggot might be raised up from the dust to the counsel of your truth and from a spirit of perversion to the understanding that comes from you, and so that he may take his place before your face with the everlasting host and the eternal spirits, so that he may be renewed together with all that is and will be and with those who have knowledge in a community of jubilation. This form of liturgical union with the worshiping congregation of the angels has rightly been called a kind of mystical practice. So the benefits conveyed through the divine transformation of this formerly abhorrent human are not simply reconciliation with God, but access to a realized eschatological joy. So in conclusion, although the traditional formulations of moral agency, sin, and atonement continued robustly throughout the whole Second Temple period, alongside of them, other ways of thinking developed that shifted concern away from the commission of specific sins to the problem of an innate sinful condition. And you could consider these developments simply the creation of highly negative views of human nature and treat them as a kind of religious pessimism. But they were also used to highlight the transforming power of God's spirit and to construct new forms of religious experience that promised a sense of moral transformation intimacy with God, and even mystical acts of liturgical communion with the angels themselves. These developments explored the religious paradox that is only by immersing oneself in deep objection that one is prepared for exaltation. I kind of like to mangle Michelle Obama's statement, you know, when they go low, we go high. What they're saying is, no, it's only by going low that we go high. That's the paradox that they explored. Thank you. 